All right, so uh, so like she said, uh, hi. I'm Noah Cantrotz. Some people will know me as Cantron on Twitter or Code Ranger, basically everywhere that isn't Twitter. Uh, I'm fairly active in the Chef and Python communities, and I'm a general operations tools developer. But enough about me. What we're here to talk about is secrets. Specifically, this talk is about infrastructure secrets. So we're not here to talk about how to store passwords on your laptop, how to store passwords in your web app. Uh, that's not what this talk is about. If you press me, I will say use one password or argon two, respectively, but no hard feelings if you want to escape. So what defines a secret in terms of infrastructure? So you could treat all private information as secret, but it's going to get unwieldy really quickly. So to keep us focused, we're going to use three properties. The first, it has to be small, usually less than a kilobyte. Uh, you may control access to much larger amounts of information through things like disk encryption or database encryption, but the secret part is going to be relatively small. Second, it needs to be radioactive. So this means that if an attacker knows it, something bad happens. For example, username, not radioactive, therefore not a secret. Passwords, radioactive, therefore a secret. And finally, they need to be required. So in most cases, we're not going to be dealing with things like graceful fallback, nice degradation, retries, etc. If your application doesn't have a password that it needs, it can't do its job, basically, period. Four types of secrets we're going to use as sort of guiding use cases through this. When we talk about passwords here, again, we're talking about servers and infrastructure. So we're talking about machine-to-machine -machine authentication, but usually things that were designed for humans at first. In general, uh, passwords can also be used by humans, but humans are allowed to cheat. They can, for instance, know something they don't tell anyone else. Computers can't do that. Either it's on disk, it's in RAM, or it doesn't exist. Um, so we're mostly going to be looking at things that are small as passwords, so usually under a kilobyte, usually one word of some kind, a string of characters. So some examples include things like SQL database passwords, HTTP proxy passwords, or Linux login passwords. In contrast to passwords, tokens are usually things built from the ground up to expect server-to-server -server interactions as opposed to originally being for people. This usually also means that they're going to be the same sort of structure. They're going to be one ASCII word of some kind, but you usually have to use them in raw form. You can't cheat and store a hash of them. So some examples of this include, for instance, uh, API credential for PagerDuty, which a lot of you probably have around, or OAuth refresher access tokens. Keys, as opposed to passwords and tokens, are going to be a lot larger. They're usually multiple kilobytes, and they have some internal structure, a header, some new lines, whatever. Uh, some examples of this include TLS keys or SSH keys. And beyond this, there's this sort of long tail of miscellaneous stuff. Some of these look close enough to one of the main three that you can make it work. So, for instance, Kerberos machine tickets, they look kind of like keys, except that they have some custom special management stuff you have to do, but you can mostly just treat them like key files. Other times, they're going to need purpose-built tools. So, for example, HIPAA log records. I can't help you with those. That's not what we're talking about here. You will occasionally need to look outside the box. This is not an exhaustive list of everything in the world of secrets. Okay, so that's what defines a secret. Now we need to take their temperature. Hot or online secrets refer to things that are used during the normal operations of an infrastructure, meaning that a server or service needs to be able to access the secret autonomously without human or, or operator intervention. For example, if you have a web server, it needs to get to a database. It uses a password for that. If an operator had to sit at the, the console and type in the password every time a new web request came in, your application's probably not going to get a whole lot of work done. So we would classify that as an online or hot secret. To compare this, we have cold secrets. These are things where you don't need them autonomously. You need them occasionally, and when you do, it's with direct human intervention. So for instance, AWS master passwords. Those are secret. They should hopefully stay very secret, but you don't need them day to day, and when you do need them, you don't need them autom autonomously. The hot versus cold dichotomy is rarely 100% clear in practice, so some secrets and tools and services are going to fall somewhere in the middle. For example, let's say we've got a small web application cluster of some kind. When you spin up a new server in that cluster, that's going to be a human-initiated operation, so that's kind of coldish. But once the service is running, it needs to be able to run autonomously, so that's more hottish. Within online or hot secrets, there's an order, another subspectrum uh, based around how often the secret changes. Most traditional secrets management systems are built around slow secrets. Once a secret is set in your system, it basically only changes either because there was an emergency, like a compromise, or because you've got industry regulations like PCI DSS that tell you you have to rotate keys every nine months, or something like TLS where they just expire if you don't refresh them. But in general, rotating a slow secret is a human-initiated action, and you're not going to want to do it very often. So for example, TLS keys, we all know they expire every year or two, but day-to-day -day we treat them as basically static files. So those are, are slow. Some newer systems are bringing in this concept of automated or rapid rotation, fast secrets. So for instance, OCSP stapling, meaning that you've effectively got a temporary TLS thing that expires after roughly 15 to 20 minutes. 
or EC2 instance credentials, which expire every six hours. Every time a secret is rotated up to a point, it's going to improve your security because you're going to automatically invalidate all previous secrets in that type. So if, for instance, your EC2 instance credentials leaked and you didn't notice, after six hours, no longer a big deal. Still fix the leak, but you don't have to worry about it indefinitely. All right, so that's properties of secrets. Let's talk about properties of secrets management systems. The principle of least access or principle of least privilege is generally attributed to Jerry Saltzer in a 1974 ACM paper. It's mostly common sense, but it is so often ignored that it bears strenuous repetition. In short, a service or tool should have only access to the secrets it needs and nothing else. The quality of every secrets management tool or platform should be judged on these two main properties. First, how well can we implement principle of least privilege? And second, how much audit information is there so that when things go wrong, and it will, you have some information about exactly what went wrong, what was accessed, when, where, and why. Other specific tools, uh, specific features, things like that, will make or break a use case for you, but always start with these two principles. All right, let's do it. Let's manage some secrets. Bam, done, we can all go home, right? <laughs> all right, I've definitely done this before. I'm sure a lot of people here don't feel like you have to raise your hand, but a lot of us have probably done this. Why was this bad? So if we look at this in the, the context of those two guiding principles, so one, principle of least access is violated because everything that has access to our source code now has access to our database password or whatever this password is for. That's probably not what we intended. There's probably things that will have access to the code, like say build machines, that shouldn't have access to the production database. Second, we have no audit logging. When somebody reads this file, it's local on some other machine. We have, you know, maybe if we installed syslog monitoring on every machine in our, our network, we could figure that out. But probably most people don't do that. You probably have no idea where this file was read or by whom or when. If you're lucky, you could tell who cloned the Git repository and when, but that doesn't really tell you a whole lot. All right, so we know this is bad, or at least we have a strong gut feeling this is bad, so we want to improve it. How are we going to store this password? Before we really talk about storage, we need to talk about what are the risks that we're protecting against. In general, this leads to threat modeling. I'm going to talk real briefly about threat modeling. So this is, again, not an exhaustive talk about threat or, or threat modeling or attack surfaces. But let's look at the eight that I think are the most important when you're talking about infrastructure secrets. Brute force, everything on the internet sees a constant parade of brute force attacks, be it over HTTP, SSH, SMTP, IMAP, whatever. These just happen. There is no way to turn them off. The best approach is, fortunately, <laughs> Uh, very well understood, because we've been dealing with this for 30 or 40 years now. I use the three R's. Rate limit all attempts to use a secret. So if you're dealing with things like logins or API use or whatever it is, if you fail login three times, your IP is banned for 10 minutes or whatever it is. That's a rate limit. Second is restrict access. Use firewalls. Use security groups. Use whatever restrictions you can put around your services uh, to make them not available. And third, rotate your secrets. If a brute force does happen, and that can be possible still, things like you know, uh, timing attacks against poorly written things. Uh, I, I will say now that it's been fixed, Monit, for example. Uh, Monit used a non-constant time compare for its passwords up until about a year ago. Um, so you could accidentally leak passwords that way. But if it took four hours to, ro to, to brute force out a password and it rotates every 60 minutes, well, that's not as big a deal anymore. Uh, and then you can also just make it completely impossible. And usually when we're dealing with infrastructure secrets, we're talking about internal services authenticating to other internal services. If it's a web app talking to a database, don't put your database on the internet. Put it on a private subnet, please. Uh, and lastly, you can use techniques that are currently beyond brute forcing, like, say, a 4096-bit RSA key. Today, that cannot be brute forced. But be aware that depending on the exact circumstance, for instance, if somebody could record traffic, uh, they could potentially break it later. So just anything where you're relying on technology to make brute force implausible, usually understand that that's a moving target. OK. First up on the more reasonable attack surfaces is a code leak. Uh, these can happen subtly over time, usually through incorrectly configured error pages that let people see your source code or your paths or whatever. Uh, but every now and then, you'll just get a GitHub oops where someone pushes to the wrong repository if you've got like a public and a private or a whatever. Sometimes code just ends up public. Um, it happens. Fortunately, this shouldn't be a big deal. We all probably know that we shouldn't be hard coding passwords into our source files. Somebody having access to our source code might be bad for the business, but that's not what I'm talking about here today. So hopefully this will not be a big deal from a security point of view. So next up, backup leak. So if you remember, there was it wasn't a hack per se, but there was a, an, a successful attack against Instagram for which they paid a bounty. It's a white hat, so we don't call it hacking, but same basic deal. Uh, 
that they ended up paying him some large amount of money. Uh, that was one of these, mostly. Um, they left a backup on S3 with active S3 or with active AWS credentials and promptly forgot about it. So, how do we deal with backup leaks? Well, so one, don't put secrets in your backups. For instance, if your secrets only ever live in RAM, then they don't end up in your backup system. You can usually think, do things like exclude files or whatever, but that can be risky because if you forget, you're going to usually opt into like backing up all of slash Etsy. Anything that you haven't blocked is going to end up added. So make sure you audit your backups. Look at what is actually getting backed up, figure out if there's anything dangerous in there, and then scrub it. Traversal attacks, I use this to group a whole bunch of related attacks. Anything where the application or service has legitimate access to a secret, but the user doesn't. For example, again, web, app, web application using a database, the web app has legit access to the database password. It needs to do its work. It's not supposed to give that to users. This can take the form of things like directory traversal, SQL injection, uh, weird XML transclude nonsense, all this kind of stuff. I all group into one category of traversal attacks. And here, the best approach is use good web app security. Don't code SQL injections. Check your paths. You don't have directory traversals. All those good things that web developers will be doing, hopefully. But just you know, remind them that they are part of the defense system. But we also have principled least access around. So if a web application doesn't have access to like you know your database root credentials no amount of attacking the web app will get those database root credentials period as an aside a frequent traversal style attack relies on the fact that a lot of people uh, and this is even advocated as a best practice by the Heroku 12 factor style or manifesto Storing secrets in environment variables. I don't like this for two main reasons. So one, most error logging systems like Sentry or Airbrake, they log all of your uh, local environment variables. You can block specific ones if you remember, and some of them like Sentry is programmed with all the major uh, Python web frameworks, so it'll block those by default. But if you have something that it doesn't expect or you forget, all of a sudden your secrets are hanging out in the clear on the log files on your error reporting server. Second. Uh, environment variables are automatically inherited by default. So if you remember, uh, I think it was last year, there was an ImageMagick remote code execution vulnerability. If you're shelling out to ImageMagick to generate thumbnails, it can see all of your secrets. This can be bad. Again, you could fix this. You can reset environment variables before you shelled out to ImageMagick, but how many of you remember to do that every time? So I consider this to be extremely dangerous. I don't recommend it, but here be dragons. Okay, back to our threat modeling. So we are up to code execution. So this means that no amount of web app security will help us here. They can execute code in the context of our application. So cool, whatever Django or Rails or Node security stuff we had was nice, but it's no longer going to help us because they're running whatever code they want. Here we've mostly got structural protection. So things like file permissions, cheroots, containers, that kind of stuff. Um, you should probably not be running your services as root. You should probably be making your, your uh, secret files only readable during startup, things like that. If you think about something like Apache, it reads your TLS private key at startup, and then it drops privileges. So even if Apache is compromised after startup, the key is sitting in memory, but nothing else can like reread it, for example. You'd have to actually attack RAM on the running process, which is sometimes more work or more difficult. All of these are old school Unix stuff, so hopefully people have a good idea of how to protect against things like this. When Dante passed through the gates of hell, he notes the inscription, abandon all hope ye who enter here. If they can run code as root, you have reached game over in most cases, with the exception of principle of least access. If that machine does not have access to a secret, they're not getting it. That's good. This is why you want principle of least access. If people tell you that Docker can keep you safe or VMs can keep you safe or whatever it is, they're probably lying. Um, if somebody is running as root, assume that every secret on the box is compromised and has to be rotated. This is also where audit logging gets to be really important because you want to see exactly what was accessed so you know what to rotate. You may think this is unlikely, but it happens. For example, uh, there was another Linux uh, local root shell vulnerability published, I believe, two days ago. So get your patching on. Another commonly ignored attack surface is laptop theft. If you're at a small company, access to a developer workstation very often means you have root on every server. So that can be real fun. Uh, fortunately, humans are the ones that use laptops, not other services. So we can use things like disk encryption and logins and multi-factor authentication and all that. But remember that it's a possible threat surface and plan for it somehow. And finally, we have what I call the higher power attack surface. This is where a lot of people draw the line on planning, either voluntarily because they just don't want to think about it, or because they actually have industry regulations they can't tell the FBI to smeg off. But things like FISA court warrants, state-sponsored hacker groups, advanced persistent threats, etc., the list goes on, gets harder and harder to plan for. 
Here, you just have to think about how far will I go, and at what point am I just going to update my resume and call it just over my head. Again, doesn't have to be an answer, but think about it. OK, threat modeling. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about uh, cryptography. Not every secrets management system requires a deep and pervasive knowledge of cryptography, but you should have some basic idea of the structure behind cryptography. Specifically, let's talk about symmetric versus asymmetric systems. With a symmetric key system, we have a secret. We generate a random key. So this is some kind of random blob. We use the key to create an encrypted version of our secret. We copy the key over to our target server. We copy the blob over to our target server. And we use the key to decrypt the blob back to our original secret. Bam, we've got our secret. To compare this with an asymmetric system, we start with a secret. We generate a public-private key pair on the server. We retrieve the public key corresponding to our server. So the private key, hopefully, never leaves the box. We don't know the private key. We don't want to know the private key. But we do take its public key. Public keys are fortunately not radioactive in the same way private keys are. But you do have to deal with them carefully, because you want to make sure that you know which key corresponds to which server. But we use the public key to generate an encrypted blob, copy it back, use the private key, get back the secret. Cool? All right. How does this actually get used for secrets management, though? That was just sort of the, the general purpose stuff. So there's three general types of secrets management systems. Symmetric pre-encryption, asymmetric pre-encryption, and trusted third party. Symmetric pre-encryption, as the name implies, uses symmetric encryption. So again, we start with a secret and a key. We generate an encrypted blob. We copy the key over to the servers that we want to have access. So in this case, the first two servers are supposed to get access to the secret, and the third is not. We put the encrypted blob in some kind of storage system, S3, a private web server, DynamoDB, Git, whatever it is. Uh, but generally, the store, it could have some kind of access controls around it. But in general, we don't really care, because if you don't have the key, the encrypted blob gets you nothing. So we can play a bit fast and loose with the storage and retrieval of the encrypted blob itself as long as we have dealt properly with the key, which we'll talk about in a second. So everyone who wants to can download the encrypted blob, but only the ones that have the key get to unlock it back to our original secret. You will note a problem here. I mentioned before you have to copy the key to the target system. The key is itself a secret. We're talking about how to manage secrets. So we haven't really solved secrets management in this case. We've really just moved down a level of recursion. This can be OK. It means you could bootstrap the system once and then use it to have nice things. But just be aware that this isn't really solving things so much as moving the goalposts around. All right, let's compare this with asymmetric pre-encryption. So again, we have a secret. Here we've got three key pairs already generated on each of the three machines. We retrieve the public key for each of the machines, or the two that we care about. Again, public keys aren't radioactive, but you do need to handle them carefully because you don't want to get confused about which key belongs to which server. We grab uh, the public keys down to our workstation, and we generate a separate asymmetrically encrypted copy for each machine. So this means that whereas before we just had the one encrypted blob, here we've got two, because we're generating encrypted copies for both A and B. But again, we put the encrypted copies back on some kind of storage system. Playing fast and loose, we don't really care who has access to them, because they're opaque binary nonsense to anybody that doesn't have the, pri the private key corresponding to that copy. So A downloads its copy, B downloads its copy, C can download A or B's copy if it wants, but it's not going to get any use out of them, and A and B use their private keys to decrypt back to the original secret. So let's compare this to a trusted third party. Those were the asymmetric pre-encryption systems. In a trusted third party system, it's a whole lot simpler. We have a secret. We have some kind of authentication credentials to talk to the trusted third party, A, B, C, and D. As the admin, I send the trusted third party a secret. You will note there's no real encryption here. We might use TLS or whatever to encrypt it in flight. But at heart, a trusted third party knows the secret in the clear. But we give it a policy, and we say only uh, credentials B and C should have access to this. And the trusted third party does that, hopefully. That's its job. So trusted third parties are effectively a silo of secrets. They know all of your secrets, but you have some kind of rule, policy, whatever framework to control who has access. The advantage of this is when we're talking about pre-encryption systems, uh, at least with symmetric ones, it means you have to manage the keys. With asymmetric ones, you need to generate those pre-encrypted copies before anyone can access things. That means if you're doing stuff like auto-scaling or self-healing systems, this can be difficult because you don't know what servers are going to exist at the time you create the secret. Trusted third parties, though, they don't care. They've got some kind of policy engine. We can write code that will do a thing. OK, I've talked a whole lot about theory. Let's talk about actual tools. Starting from the top again, text files. 
We already talked a bunch about this, so I'm not going to dwell on it. Uh, this can be putting secrets in the applications repo. This can be making a repo called secrets. Or this can be SCPing files around individually. That last one's pretty popular with TLS keys. In general, don't do this. We already talked about why. Moving on. Next step. A lot of people say, well, I want to put it in Git because Git's really convenient. But I know that I shouldn't put it in the clear, so I'll try encrypting it. There's a lot of tools for this, but Gitcrypt is probably the best of them. So if you're going to do this, you might as well use Gitcrypt. Um, it supports both symmetric and asymmetric operations, et cetera, et cetera. But it's still not a great idea for a lot of the same reasons. Principal least access is now more doable via the pre-encryption systems, but audit logs are still non-existent. Also, with Gitcrypt in particular, and with all of these tools for Git in general, you usually have to specifically mark files as desired to be encrypted, meaning if you ever forget one, you may just not notice and push stuff to Git in the clear, in which case you need to find that one Stack Overflow answer on how to erase things from Git history, because none of us remember how to do it. <laughs> OK, so we're not going to put them in Git, but we want to put them somewhere. So we've got these nice key value stores lying around, Zookeeper, Console, etcd, etc. I'm just kind of throwing these into one bucket. That's OK. They all do have ACL systems now, uh, but they range from OK-ish, uh, consoles are pretty good, to Zookeepers, where I've never actually seen anybody implement Zookeeper ACLs properly, as far as I can tell. Uh, so uh, there are tools you can also use to layer encryption on top of these, but in general, I don't recommend this. Being active in the Chef community, the next thing I see a lot of people reach for is encrypted data bags, because it says encryption right there in the name. That makes it safe, right? Cool. Well, it's a symmetric pre-encryption system, which, as we discussed, means now you've got to manage those keys. In Chef, people usually just accept that Knife Bootstrap will copy the keys around for you, but then they kind of don't pay attention to it. So, like, key rotation? Meh. Um, this can be useful if you are using something like Hosted Chef, where all that you want is deniability that the server, a server compromise cannot give access to the secrets. But in general, I would skip this. Ansible Vault is a similar tool to encrypted data bags, but it takes advantage of Ansible's push-based nature so that the, the decryption key is only needed on the workstation running Ansible, not on all the target machines. So you can actually be a human that sits there and types in the password. But again, it's a symmetric system, so where did that password come from? Did you copy it out of a wiki? Cool, great storage system there. Um, also, again, we don't really have audit logging, so I don't like this. EML is probably the closest equivalent in the Puppet world. Um, the difference is that Puppet does all the decryption on the Puppet Master, so it's a trusted third-party system instead of a pre-encryption system. Uh, specifically, it uses uh, either PKCS7 or GPG for the encryption module, so it can be either symmetric or asymmetric. In general, whenever you're talking about a trusted third-party system, gut check your faith in its internal access controls and its policy framework. If you don't think that you want to trust that, then maybe don't use it. In this case, here, EML is fine, and it's probably safe to use, at least as far as I know. Back to a Chef-specific tool, Chef Vault. No relation to Ansible Vault. They just keep reusing the same name. This takes advantage of the fact that Chef uses RSA key pairs for its API authentication to build an asymmetric pre-encryption system for distributing the symmetric keys of Chef encrypted data bags. It's not really as complicated in practice as I am explaining it, but it's an asymmetric pre-encryption system, so it's not great if you're doing anything related to auto-scaling or self-healing because nothing is sitting around there to keep regenerating those encrypted copies. All right, leaving the realm of single CM tools, we've got HashCorp Vault. New kit on the block, but already making people interested and hopefully more excited about secrets management. Um, it's got all the things you'd expect from a purpose-built secrets management platform, so good audit logs, good ACLs, modular authentication frameworks, modular storage frameworks, um, and it's also got probably the best-of-breed auto-rotation system for fast secrets. Slightly older, but still very solid, is Square's KeyWiz. It's got a slightly more limited data model than HashCorp Vault, but that also means that it's a lot more battle-tested. I'll talk more about KeywizFS, which is one of its defining features later, but as the name implies, KeyWiz excels at key-type secrets, less so for things like passwords and tokens. You can, uh, excuse me, you can do it, but it's a little bit more complicated. Okay, if you're on S3, my personal recommendation for people on S3 is to just use a private S3 bucket, or on AWS, is to use a private S3 bucket with an IAM policy and instance roles. You don't really need anything more than that in the simple cases. This is somewhat annoying because you have to go learn how to write IAM policies, but you can do all of this. I've got a great document for the chef world if you look up a thing called Citadel that I wrote. It's not really very much code, but it's a long guide on how to do this for the chef world. Before I talk about any of the other AWS-related ones, I need to explain Amazon KMS. Most people think of this as a key management system. It's not, despite the name. Um, it's actually a key escrow system. So this doesn't store anything. It holds keys 
in memory somewhere off in Amazon land, and you can pass data to it to be encrypted or to be decrypted. But you don't actually get to use it to store your own secrets. You have to deal with the storage and management of that on your own. Fortunately, there's some tools around to help with that. So Sneaker from Code Hale is a command line tool that uses KMS for encryption and decryption, but uses S3 for storage. It's a command line tool, so you have to do explicit pushes and pulls of secrets, but it hooks up sort of KMS and S3 into a more complete secrets management platform. Similarly, CredStash, um, instead of using S3 for the backing store, it uses DynamoDB, otherwise relatively similar. And Confidant from Lyft also does KMS and DynamoDB, but rather than being a command line tool, it's got a REST API and a web framework and a, a, a sorry, web front end, all those nice things. I usually prefer using things that have APIs rather than command line tools because they're a little bit easier to work with under automation. Um, Confidant also has a very nice versioning and history system for secrets. Trousseau is going back to the command line tool world. This one, instead of using KMS for encryption, it uses GPG. So this can be nice if you're not on AWS. Uh, it has modular storage backends, so it can use S3, SCP, or GitHub for storage. Um, but the downside is that GPG is by neckbeards for neckbeards. So automated key generation, key distribution, key management, all that fun stuff can be a little bit difficult. It's not impossible, but expect to spend a lot of time staring at man pages. SOPS from Mozilla, uh, they, it combines the properties of the last couple of tools. So it can do either KMS or GPG or both. So if you're on a hybrid system where you're dealing with both Amazon and some other cloud or Amazon and bare metal, this can be handy. Unfortunately, it doesn't do storage management, so you'll need to figure out how you want to actually store the encrypted blobs and deal with transferring them around. Red October from Cloudflare is a very different beast. All the other systems we've been looking at so far are really aimed at either online slash hot secrets or somewhere in the middle. Red October is built from the ground up for cold secrets. So if you remember during uh, movies or whatever you've seen, when you want to launch a missile, you have to have two people coordinate. So you turn both keys at the same time. Same general idea. You have to have multiple people coordinating. It's called a key split algorithm or an N of M key split or some your secret sharing if you want to be fancy. Um, that allows you to designate this secret requires three of five key holders to coordinate in order to unlock this secret. You can use this for online secrets by saying one of five or one of one or whatever it is, but in general it's built for those high value cold secrets, things like an AWS master password or a GPG top level revocation certificate, stuff like that. Presented for completeness, Barbican was supposed to be the OpenStack solution to correspond to Amazon KMS, but it's not really a thing, sorry. Um, I think I see Spencer making sad faces in the back there. <laughs> All right, I mentioned Conjure because it's the one I see most often, but this also applies to Thycotic and CyberArk and basically every other closed source vendor provided lovely secrets management system. Trust but verify. If somebody's not giving you access to their source code, they should hopefully have a one hell of a security audit they can show you. Um, I generally do not like trusting security code that I can't read. Amazon KMS kind of gets a pass because I don't really have a choice there, but everything else, I get real antsy around closed source tools. But I will state for the record, open source is not a guarantee of security, and how many people here have actually read all of OpenSSL? <laughs> okay, and the biggest gun. In the, the world of secrets, the, the biggest solution is going to be hardware security modules. There's also what's called TPMs, or Trusted Platform Modules, which are sort of the baby brothers to HSMs. TPMs come on basically every motherboard. HSMs, however, are very expensive, like many, many tens of thousands of dollars for a lot of them. Um, they're also very complicated and difficult to use and widely varying, but if used properly, they are super duper bulletproof. The basic idea of either a TPM or an HSM is you're going to hold some kind of key, usually the private key to an asymmetric key pair, in a piece of hardware such that that private key cannot be extracted short of boiling the chip in hot acid and then reading it out with an electron microscope. But firmware bugs are not unheard of. It is possible for things to go wrong. If you want to explore using either TPMs or HSMs, probably hire some very highly paid consultants. Through all of this, we keep dancing around the really hard problem of secrets management. Deep down, any secrets management system needs to establish an identity relationship between the thing that wants secrets and the thing that has secrets. Figuring out how to bootstrap this initial identity relationship is very difficult. In a lot of cases, it boils down to, I'm going to SSH to some IP address, whatever picks up on the other side of this first SSH connection, I'm going to assume it is identity X. From that point forward, you can build lovely, nice temples. However, that initial trust is what you're basing everything on. If somebody intercepted that first SSH connection, you're screwed. 
So always figure out what your initial identity assumptions are. Some clouds, for example, have stronger initial identity assumptions. Um, in the case of Amazon, there's the instance identity document. They can use the fact that the, the Amazon hypervisor and the EC2 metadata service is allowed to cheat and really, really knows who your VM is, and it can give you a signed blob proving your identity. Um, it, Google has a similar system for their cloud. Azure has a similar system for their cloud. OpenStack, unfortunately, does not. If you're on bare metal, you can use uh, HSMs or TPMs for building identity systems. But it's sort of all over the place. Figure out what your identity assumptions are and figure out how you're going to model that in the context of a secrets management system. Also, as a corollary to this, if you take it as a given that you need to build some kind of identity structure for your network, you can sometimes just skip the secrets part. A lot of services, like MySQL and Postgres, for example, support TLS client certificate authentication. And as we mentioned, public keys and certificates and things like that are not radioactive in the same way, so they're not really secrets. They still need to be dealt with very carefully, because you don't want the, right, the wrong certificate to go to the wrong place, uh, but it does remove the sort of single string of radioactivity that you have with a database password. All right, and in the last couple minutes, let's talk about how to integrate some of those tools that we talked about into your existing toolkits. For a lot of these things, they have their own API, and therefore they have API client libraries. So for HashCorp Vault, for example, there's uh, HVAC and Vault Rails in Python and Ruby, respectively. And for KMS, there's Boto Core and AWS SDK for Python and Ruby, respectively. For example, here's uh, using HVAC in your Django settings file. So in this case, you're just having Django talk directly to, to Vault to get its database password. This can be very handy for things you control. For things you don't control, like, say, Nginx, which you're not going to go patch to read its keys directly out of, uh, you know, KeyWiz or Vault or whatever, you can integrate them through your config management layer. So in the case of Chef, you can do things like call uh, command line tools like Sneaker, or you could use things, so my Citadel library is a way of calling to uh, get stuff in private S3 buckets directly in your CM code. I said I would talk about KeywizFS real quickly. So it's a Fuse file system that speaks as a REST client directly to the KeyWiz service. This means that when you uh, request a key from it, it ends up buffered only in RAM. It's not ever written to disk. It's much safer. It's a lot easier to use with things that you didn't write. So for instance, in that, that Nginx example, you can say just load your private key from slash keys slash Nginx slash private dot pem. And it's going to get its secrets management stuff all nice and handled. You don't have to actually change anything inside Nginx. Console templates was originally written for uh, writing stuff from the console service discovery tool out into files, but it also now supports HashCorp Vault. So this can be used if you want to write things that are running at a higher rate of refresh than your CM stuff. So for instance, if you're running Chef or Puppet once a day, but you want to rotate your database password once an hour, you can have Chef configure console templates, and console templates configures your database passwords. Similar to console templates is env console, but instead of writing things to files, this stores things in environment variables. I already said why I don't love this, so I'm just going to kind of move on, but it does exist. And similar to env console is a thing called summon. Um, this has multiple backends, so it can do things like S3 or conjure or local key rings, but again, it's storing them in environment variables, which I'm not a huge fan of. And to close things out, let's talk real fast about secrets management in a buzzword compliant container deployment. So Kubernetes technically has the most mature secrets implementation, but this is a real low bar. I don't actually consider kube secrets to be safe enough to use right now because currently uh, any kubelet can access any secret, bar none. Um, this means that you can only barely implement principle of least access. The individual containers are access restricted, but all it takes is one container oops and you no longer have any protections. Docker Swarm, specifically Docker Swarm 113, which is coming out hypothetically tomorrow, will include a very simple secrets management system. If you are a Swarm user, you should check that out. This only works in the fancy Swarm mode. If you're just using raw Docker, this doesn't help you at all. But it hasn't been released yet, so I can't really tell you if this is good or not. Um, Nomad doesn't bother having its own secrets management system in favor of deep integration with HashCorp Vault, but Vault is great, so that's cool with me. And finally, Marathon. 1.3 uh, of, of Marathon, which is an app framework for Mesos, claims to have shipped an API for secrets management. I cannot find any documentation on this. There is the commercial side of this from Mesosphere as part of DCOS, but I cannot find any documentation on this API in the open source world. So, uh? Here be dragons with containers. In general, the container world has not really sorted out secrets management, so just be careful. So, finally... The steps that I recommend for good secrets management. Check your privilege in your audit trail. 
pick your types and temperatures of secrets, think about your attack surfaces, and have a disaster plan for when everything goes wrong. Thank you very much. And briefly... If you're hiring, you should probably come talk to me. And finally, any questions? And if you have questions, please use the microphone so they'll be recorded for posterity. <laughs> Plenty of time. So you listed a lot of solutions there. Um, you know, kind of what do you see um, as something that's like very, very mature versus, you know, basically what do you kind of go to when you're looking to solve this problem? And I, I, I know that that is a very open-ended yep. question. And People ask me this every time, and there's a reason I leave it until the end, and it's, there's not really a great answer. Um, if it's pure AWS, the, the private S3 buckets with or without KMS is a good approach, and I highly recommend that as very safe, well understood, Writing good IAM policies is not the easiest thing in the world, but humans can do it. If you're not all on AWS, HashCorp Vault gets my vote, but be aware that it doesn't have great integration. Like, I work in mostly the Chef world. It doesn't have really great integration with Chef. You can make it work, but it's all kind of ramshackle right now. Uh, Patrick Kelso from British Telecom. I was just wondering if you'd seen uh, Aqua Security for Docker images. I'm just about to start trialing it. I was wondering if you had any info on that. Uh, I'm not super familiar with the thing you're referring to. Do you mean their their tough implementation in registry, the notary system? Uh, no, they have secret management that supposedly only allows the process in the container to access the secret. So there's there's the thing that's shipping tomorrow in 113, which is that. Okay. I don't know if that's the same thing you're referring to, which uh, the documentation is still in a pull request, so I, I skimmed what best I could of the conversation in there, but it's it's not yet actually, like the documentation has not actually been merged yet. Hi, uh, Nikolai Plum from Booking.com. You only mentioned one um, secret sharing thing, Red October. Mm -hmm. Are they or are they that thin on the ground, or are there more out there? Yeah, it's the only one I know of. Um, HashCorp Vault does use uh, some of secret sharing for sealing their sort of a master password for unlocking the whole service, but individual secrets, I don't think it supports that. It might now, um, but overall, Red October is the one that people reach for. There's not really a whole lot of people that use cold storage for a whole lot of things, so that's a pretty rare use case. Okay, thanks. All right, well, thank you very much. If anyone else has questions, I'll be around. Cheers. Cheers.